Good. 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 Happy, you happy ideas, everyone. I'm Steve podcast. Clemens. I'm Washington editor at large of the Atlantic. It's really fun to be with all of you today, and I hope we can make this a fun, interactive talk about the state of civitas, the state of civic engagement, mutual respect, civic sensibilities uh, in the country. This morning, uh, the Atlantic hosted a small kind of weird thing. We had a mini unconference where uh, we brought people in. We didn't really tell them anything other than to come in and, and just sort of sort out what they thought about the state of debate today in the country and what to, whether it was a problem, whether it was not a problem, what to do. And we divided the group into four groups. We got the Madison group, the Hamilton group, the Jefferson group, and the Burr group. And uh, a, a, a wonderful talent and a real bright light here at Aspen Ideas, Vivian Nixon, who is executive director of, of College and Community Fellowship, came back at the end, and we had, we had Burr, Hamilton, Jefferson, and Madison all sort of share the reports from their group. And in the spirit of Lin-Manuel Miranda, uh, uh, Vivian came out and wrapped hers uh, and sort of shared with us in quick form, brilliantly, just a bit of the stuff that pumped through the group this morning. And I thought, what a wonderful way to start this discussion we're going to have on stage. So ladies and gentlemen, Vivian Nixon, Reverend Vivian Nixon. Right. Thank on. you so much, Steve, for this wonderful invitation. It's really a pleasure to be on stage with such powerful and intelligent people who are really helping us move forward in this country. Um, Steve gave you the background, so I'm just going to hit it. So if you all could just clap for me. Clap. Clap. the debate. Did uh, there we go. Okay, here we go. One more time. Clap. 2008, Obama became great. Racism and anger fueled the debate. Deindustrialization changed the economy. The American green became a big mystery. Liberals, elites, votes for sale. Power in religion tell a different tale. Police and courts, churches, business, and schools. People don't trust them because they all break the rules. Learn to understand people not like you. Learn to say, I want to get next to you. Poverty, ignorance, lack of education, workforce, healthcare, mass incarceration, breaking down silos, ending new segregation. Working together, we can change the situation. Opening doors, funding equality. Everybody needs opportunity. Recruit leaders from every background. Give real power to those who we let down. Messengers must be authentic and effective. Inequality in our society cannot be accepted. So ladies and gentlemen, yeah. Thank you, Vivian. Thank you very much. And I know you've got a lunch to get to. But she did that in 30 minutes this morning. So I don't know what to expect from all of you. I mean, I want to see what David Gergen's going to do by the time this is over. So, uh, uh, but, but thank you so much, Vivian. That really launched us in a great way. Now, we're, we're here. We've got a, a wonderful panel. Of course, uh, to far, my far left, we have David Gergen, who's professor of public service and co-director of the Center for Public Leadership at Harvard uh, Kennedy School, a trustee here at Aspen, an advisor to just about every president uh, who has been, lived in the modern era. And uh, we'll see what happens uh, uh, after this <laughs> next one, whether, you know, depending on how it turns, whether you'll keep up your streak. Uh, and then we have, of course, Randy Weingarten, who is an education icon in the United States, provocative, controversial, uh, on the front page of the Wall Street Journal tomorrow. I've already seen the, 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 uh, the lead for it. Um, president, of course, of the American Federation of Teachers. And I should acknowledge that she and I had a discussion a while back about how to get people to think about not just ferocious debate, but thinking about the merits of their opponent's arguments. And I just want to say she did something very brave. I brought a guy named Checker Finn, who's one of the biggest advocates for charter schools, uh, has been a substantial critic of Randy's. And I got Randy to come on stage, who's of course been a substantial critic of the other side of the equation, to change places and to argue each other's positions. And she did an incredible job. It was brave, it was smart, and that set the tone for what we were trying to do today. Mitch Landry, we, we know, is just, you know, like 
mayor of the country, uh, <laughs> mayor of New Orleans. Uh, it's a real pleasure to have him. And Michael Steele, who's just a, become a superstar, as we all know, an MSNBC, CEO of the Steele Group, former chair of the Republican National Committee. Um, Everybody has soul on this stage, but he has a lot of soul, uh, and, and I really appreciate everyone being here. Cool. Let me just say, yeah. before we start, one of the, th um, uh, how many of you may have known Father Healy of Georgetown University? Anybody here? Thank you. I mean, he was, you know, he w I mean, I, I would love to kind of get a group to talk about this guy, because this guy ran a, a uh, he's no longer with us, but he ran a course at Georgetown on Arab-Israeli relations, and he would have you know, his Jewish students come in and he would assign them to come in and argue the Arab side of the equation uh, regarding the Israel-Palestinian dispute. And he would get the, the, um, his, his uh, uh, Jewish students to come in and argue the Arab side and vice versa, the Arab students. And I met a, an ambassador, I don't want to mention where he is, but he was a member of the Saudi royal family who, sh who went to Georgetown and he shared with me that the hardest thing he ever did in his life was that class and having to argue persuasively and compellingly the Israeli side of the equation. He said it changed his life, it made him understand much more of the world and how important it was to walk on the other side of issues. And I wanted to start with that theme and, 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 and you know, begin the discussion with David Gergen because you've seen so much, you and I have had conversations before, and you sort of lament in a way the state of civic debate in the country. And I'd love to just get a snapshot of what you think has made if you agree, made the environment so toxic? Oh, I, I, I'm very distressed, as I think almost everybody in this room is, about the state of our civic life altogether. It's, it goes beyond discourse. I, I think, obviously, th this campaign uh, has, has uh, I think, disturbed all of us uh, with, with the quality of the rhetoric and that sort of thing and what it portends for the future and the deepening. Uh, if one could even believe this would happen, <clears throat> the deepening uh, polarization that, that is occurring. And I think the question becomes then, what can we do to repair our civic life? <clears throat> to Lincoln's words in the second inaugural, how can we bind up our wounds uh, and, and create a sense once again that we all, uh, that we may have come in different ships, but now we're in the same boat together. Uh, which is, you know, that sense is, is missing from the community. I would argue that um, in the campaign, there's been a lot of stress upon what more the government can effectively provide for people. And I think that's important. We do need more opportunities for, for people. But I would argue that when we've been at our best, it is when we have provided opportunities by also asking responsibilities from those who we're, we're, for whom we're providing. The two best most significant human uh, resource programs we've had in the country in the last 100 years were both of that type. One was the CCC under Franklin Roosevelt. And <clears throat> Roosevelt proposed it in the spring of, of, of 34, and by that summer, the, the Civilian Conservation Corps had 250,000 young men working, working for a dollar a day in the woods, working in national parks, and it was a nine-year program, the most popular program in the New Deal. It provided jobs for young people, but in exchange for work. And that's a very important concept. And similarly, after World War II, we had 16 million veterans. We had the GI Bill, and it provided educational opportunities for nearly 8 million veterans coming back. We doubled the number of young people going to college in the United States as a result of the GI Bill. We helped to create a middle class. And what was that all about? <coughs> We're going to give you an education in return for your service. And it seems to me that's what we ought to be looking for now as a way to bind up our wounds. There ought to be a way we could work with Randy. In, if we had an urban conservation corps, civilian conservation corps, that could work in our school, not take jobs from teachers, but work with teachers, try to help and everything like I think those kinds of things would make a major. But David, where, where is that idea you suggested of some form of service or service beyond oneself to, to you know, some sort of national goal? Right. Um, where is that unpopular? Who would be the enemy of that idea? Uh, it's, it's, it gets lip service from a lot of people. Uh, the Aspen Institute with Franklin Project started off with, uh, with, with General McChrystal moving down this road. I'm, I've been a part of that. Um, but it, re meets, it meets a lot of resistance from people to say, well, how much will it cost? And I, that's an understandable question. But he here's the deal I think we could make. And that is American corporations have at least a trillion dollars. Some people think as much as two trillion dollars sitting overseas they would like to bring home. 
because they've, uh, but because of the high taxes here, high corporate taxes, they don't want to bring it home. They're just letting it sit there. Once they're investing in some overseas. The next president can make a deal. We're going to let you bring that home, but in exchange for that, we want a piece of it to create jobs for young people in this country. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And get them, get them the kind of training. Yeah, exactly. That'll right. get them jobs. So, but, so, yes, 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 amen, amen, amen. The, um, Enough of that, kind of. <laughs> no, no. I, it's like, you know, but I think to your point, so a few years ago, I proposed that every junior high and high school student have some kind of service or project-based instruction. Mm -hmm. Because part of how we would really actually engage in civitas is we have to get kids to actually walk in each other's shoes right. and not just have a 32-minute exercise once in a social studies class about debating something. That we, part of the reason why we actually made some progress on moving away from the test fixation in schools is because people have actually started to buy this argument. But to David's point about actually getting it into schools, I get a lot of lip service. Oh, great idea. Uh, we're never going to be able to do that. But at the end of the day, if we started in terms of high school students thinking about how to get high school students to engage their own agency in their own local communities and how to actually be involved in their own local communities and do it as a project for credit, either as teams or individually. That starts getting the sense of both engagement and responsibility. Um, and so I think that we can, that's, that's really, really important. To your other point about, I've watched what you've said in a place like Cincinnati, where we do have, in most schools, wraparound services where business is engaged and others are engaged. So you have a school which is on the foothills of Appalachia, Euler Elementary School, where we actually give kids food bags over the weekend, not just for themselves, but for their family. And we do it as bags so that there's no stigma. People take it, people don't take it. There's lots of other things that we do in terms of children's well-being. But one of the things is there's a tutoring room. And AT&T and, and a couple of the other corporations in Cincinnati person the tutoring room. And But what it does is it creates this um, connection between adults who these kids may never have seen before and adults who all of a sudden now know that Randy is my kid and that Randy is the kid. So when, if Randy gets in trouble or if Randy needs some help, Randy and I are together as a team. So let me, let me, let me just challenge you for a moment. What you just Sorry, it was a, off the field from I, what I was no, going to no, talk no. about. But <laughs> it sounds really warm and fuzzy, um, real warm and fuzzy, and, it, and, it, and you know, nice and nice world. But you know, when I sort of look around the country and look at these pockets of concern, of course, we had this incredible young man this morning named Berto. I don't know if he's here. Is Berto here? It's too bad. I wish he was, because he is a uh, former gang member. Uh, he was from uh, in a gang in, in, in high school from 13 to 17 years of old age. And he, through a string of events, he sort of moved out of the gang world but brought a lot of the trappings and methodology, the sense of family and protection and concern, and found ways to express that in other kind of community bridge building things. And so I just want to trust you, know, when, you're, when you're looking at Venice High School, and I hear there are 90 organized gangs in, say, Venice High School in the arena that you're talking about, and you've got a lot of movements around the country of people who feel like they've been victims and that they live in a zero-sum competition with others who are getting more than they're getting. So it creates our, how do you, how do you deal with that environment? Well, there, you have to actually I know figure you're out. A worker, so. so look, we, rough side. frankly, you know, there's an entity in New York called Council for Unity, mm. which dealt with many Venice high schools in New York City and confronted gang, gangs in New York City for years and if you've noticed in New York City, crime is down substantially for lots of different reasons. Some of it is economic, some of it has other reasons. But what council does and what Berto's talked about today is what is it within gang behavior 
that pulls that gang together. Mm. It's the lack of power. It's a lack of empowerment. It's a lack of enfranchisement. And what some of these groups do is that they substitute that kind of love. And I don't mean it to be touchy-feely, it, but it's basically saying, let's find a positive way to channel this. Now, having said that, that's not the only thing you have to do. There's lots of reasons, and Walter said it uh, evidently on, on Sunday, the, the, we have a racial and an economic fault line in this country that is tremendous. We didn't do what we needed to do after deindustrialization and globalization, and that is, that is creating a lot of anger. And as Vivian just said, in terms of the racial fault lines, with the birther movement and all this, when Barack Obama became president, it raises a lot of issues, just like you know, we're taking on an entire religion in terms of, and, and in terms of the Islamophobia. So I'm not, I'm not suggesting that there's one way of doing this, but I am saying that if we do not actually create a sense of civitas and, and, and kids actually learning to, to listen to each other and understand various different sides of an argument, even if they disagree, if we don't start there, then we lose another generation. And so we have to start somewhere. Mm -hmm. Mitch? I just say kids do what their parents do. <clears throat> if you think about it. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, if you, if you were a kid and you turned on Fox or CNN and you listened and you saw the level of dialogue and the acrimony, you would think the whole world was coming apart and everybody hated everybody and they mirror our behavior. Every parent knows that as a child and for the children that Randy was talking about, way too many of them. Um, I, I just make a couple of points. And the one, um, most of what we talk about at this conference is informed by what's happening on the federal level and its relationship to federal legislation and the relationship of the United States to the international community. And you could get despondent about the future, but I, I, you really shouldn't be. You know, there's a lot of really great stuff mm -hmm. going on in this country, mostly amongst the mayors um, and in cities where the innovation has to take place. So now that the federal government's not functioning well, uh, and I don't think that's very debatable, um, what, what, what you find, though, is the world doesn't stop. So Michael knows this because he was a lieutenant governor. When things get down to the local level, they don't stop. They don't. Something's got to happen and yep. something's got to give. So while everybody's yelling about all the stuff that's gone on terribly, mayors are beginning to innovate all across America. And as David and both Randy were talking about, we're conceptualizing programs where we're trying to connect kids in neighborhoods that don't know each other. Now, in New Orleans, and I'm sure this is true everywhere else, um, we have neighborhoods that are a block apart, but a world away. <coughs> In other words, you could take a kid, let's call him Jimmy, that lives on this side of St. Charles Avenue in New Orleans. This is the parade route, by the way, if any of you haven't been there. And on this side is the Garden District. That's where Peyton Manning grew up. And if you took both of these kids who go to the Mardi Gras parade and enjoy catching beads together, and then they go home at night, and then you track their lives from pre-K all the way through either to prison or to you know, being the MVP, you can see this incredible divide that exists. And there's not much that has bound us together. So income equality is not just about moving money from one place to the next. It's about disparate neighborhoods, people not seeing each other. You know, we always say the most segregated hour is on, you know, Sunday at church. That's not, that is true, but it's not the only thing that's true. And everything that you're seeing on the national level during this campaign is not the cause of, but a symptom of what we have allowed to infect us and how we as adults respond. And so I would, the first thing I would say is it's on us. Um, and you might be surprised to know that politicians will do what you, the voters, want us to do. If I do three flips and you give me an applause, I'm gonna do three flips again. <laughs> because I want you to vote for me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. we, we wanna see it. And so in some ways, if you think about it, you know, when, when, when they asked, I'll just give you an example about, about Mr. Trump when they had this argument about, well, should you start using the teleprompter? Should you be more presidential? Should you not? He's going, look, the shtick I got got me to where I am, so I think I'm going to keep doing it. And that was an argument within his own campaign. Mm. That's not a little thing. That's kind of a big thing. And so I would just say to all of us, um, this campaign is going to end at some time, and it's going to end a certain way or not, that we really have to be purposeful about what we expect of our political leaders, business leaders, corporate leaders, and what we demand mm. in terms of how we behave. I think that's important because I think that we can have a major impact in how we conduct ourselves and we can first start doing it by setting an example of how we argue with each other and then demand, and here's the thing that the mayors really get upset about in watching Congress. 
they won't, they won't, they, number one, they won't debate, right. which is a huge problem because at least you want to, at least want to have a fight. At least. We can argue. At least. Right? So that we can have in, in the contest of ideas. Yeah. Secondly, there has to be a resolution. I mean, there's got, because we, the, we have, to, our republic has to keep moving, but you can't decide not to talk and then not to do anything. That is the definition of creating frustration. So I think we have to put pressure on them to whatever they're going to do. But don't you see a lot of people it. deciding not to talk and not to do? <clears throat> I think it's. I just. I think it's built. It's just insane. David knows this better than I do. It's almost built into the way the House and the Senate were designed. When a senator can stop the country, one senator from doing anything, or the Speaker of the House decides he's not going to bring something to the House floor unless twenty-five, only twenty-five percent of his caucus votes for us. I think everybody in here thinks. Um, they're going to throw an idea on the House floor. There's going to be a debate between 435 democratically elected people, and the majority is going to win. That's not what happens. And so I think that gets frustrating. But in the meantime, as we get down to the ground, Randy actually got on the ground where you have these young men who I can just tell you, the racial divide in this country is dramatic. It's deep. Um, we have to talk about it. But you have a lot of young men, particularly um, African-American, that feel completely uh, forsaken. Yep. I guess is, is the most clear word. And as a consequence, they find fellowship and love and communion in getting together with other kids. And in the reality that they live in, <clears throat> it actually becomes an upside down reality from what you live in. And what you think is irrational behavior is perfectly rational behavior to them, which is like, unless I protect myself, you know, nobody else is coming to help me because when the police show up, they're not going to help me, they're going to hurt me. That kind of tension cannot continue to exist in the country if we're going to have stability. And so you see movements arising out of the inability to be heard. And I would argue that, that what happened with Operation Wall Street was one. I think the Sanders movement is one. I think the Tea Party is one. I think the Trump campaign is one. And I think it's evidence to us, if we haven't heard it loudly enough, we got to get back together. And the adults in the room have to demand that we figure out a way to have constructive discussions that are going to lead us to a better place. It's your city has been uh, really, <laughs> your, your city's been, been very, it has been gut punched, has had a lot of tough uh, challenges. And I've always been wanting to ask you, as a mayor, because you're sitting here supposed to be the guy, the Wizard of Oz who knows everything, have, 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 you know, have your constituents ever done anything in building community that just completely shocked and surprised you that said, whoa? Well, I, that's, a, that's a low or a high? That says a high. Well, listen, you know, we, we were dead. I mean, 1,800 people were killed, 500,000 homes got hurt, 250,000 destroyed. We lost everything. Everybody on this stage came down to help us. All of you not only sent us your prayers and your thoughts, but you came down to assist us. And something really amazing happened in the city of New Orleans for a really beautiful moment. People lost their personal identity and actually came together as one city, and people that would never get together with the other helped each other out. And there's been an incredible communion, and as a result of that, the city of New Orleans is not only alive again, but doing well. That's why I'm telling you, I'm testifying to you that this is possible. Our country's not even close to being at the point of no return. We can get this back. We've done it many, many, many times, but here's the thing. You have to decide to do it. And you have to make people who you, you represent you on the corporate side, on the private side, on the faith-based side, not-for-profit, right, and in the community, and the leaders particularly, you have to demand it. And then you have to act that way, and you have to reward it. Um, unfortunately, it's not unless you have a near-death experience where you feel like you have no other alternative do you actually come together. So something like Orlando will bring us together really quickly, but unfortunately momentarily, and then we get back to the fighting, and that's unfortunate. We've got to find a way to sustain it. So I would just say, let's have a good argument. Let's be tough-minded with each other. Let's be hard on the problem and soft on the people. Let's get to a resolution. Let's move to the next thing. And you know that's the way the republic works. And I think that we've gotten away from that, and I think we're the worst for it at the moment. But just on the federal level, local level, we're rocking it, and there's a lot of good stuff going on. So, Michael, I want to bring you in, but, but as you answer, I want, you know, you and David are our professional pundits here, like you're, like, out there handicapping these various campaigns, <laughs> and, uh, God help us. Uh, yeah, but, but, you know, I, I think part of the question lurking in the back of everyone's mind here is, do you think somebody like Donald Trump can play by these rules? Is there, you know, can, can he exist under, with uh, all of us, whether he wins or loses, under one roof as well? 
I mean, I think that's the question, is that many people feel like this, that society in some ways is tearing itself apart. Uh, some people in this room may, uh, and, I, and I suppose do support Donald Trump, uh, or, Hil or you know, Hillary Clinton, of course, but in, in that process of, of having the good fight, but then after the fight's over, respecting losers as much as the prerogative of winners, that it's not a winner takes all. And I'd just love to get your sense. You know the game real well. Are, yeah, are we I so far along that we're no longer under one roof, no longer on one boat, to quote David? Oh, no, we got off the boat a long time ago. <laughs> oh, no, we, no, this is a, we're in a very different space, and it, and it really goes back. I think I want to set up my answer by sort of recapping what we just heard. You know, I was sitting here, I was laughing to myself as we were kind of going from David to Randy to to the mayor here, and I was thinking, I guess now I'm supposed to disagree with all of this because I'm the conservative on the stage. I don't, but I got that out so everybody can relax now. Right? Yeah. Um, How conservative are you really? Very, yeah. <laughs> very, <laughs> very. Um, I, I, I'm old school, baby, I'm old school. Okay. Um, but what we heard were three things that struck me, community, Education, uh, ideas, solutions, Randy. People, family, home. And those three components have become fractured, disconnected from one another. And it's reflected in our politics, where we cannot have a civil conversation within our community because we're now red and blue people. Right? We cannot deal with the programs and solutions that our teachers, who are, who are at the, the apex, the, the tip of the spear, of not currently but future generations, we cannot figure out how to have a common sense dialogue about solutions that may help our kids. And at home, we're perpetrating or, or perpetuating bad attitudes, bad lessons. I remember when I was lieutenant governor and we were doing a review of our educational system in Maryland and I was sitting down. I spent a year because I wanted to see education through the eyes of a child. So I got up at 5 a.m. and stood at a bus stop as a kindergartner, a fifth grader, a high schooler has to do every day to get on the bus to get to school. I had lunch at 10 a.m. Didn't have anything else to eat the rest of the day. And the teachers are saying, the reason we're having a problem in the classroom is because of this crazy schedule that we've been forced to right. deal with. No one was listening to the parents and the teachers. But then there were the parents at home who were jealous of their kids getting an education. Unbelievable. I could not fathom that a mom or a dad would be jealous of the fact that their child is getting an education because they had a bad experience in school. They wanted their kid to have a bad experience in school. So that is, that's what we have these forces working at home. When we get into the broader conversation about civility and respect, where does it come from? Where is it taught? Where is it learned? Where is it applied? It isn't. So we have as much responsibility for that as the institutions we're looking to, the elected officials that we are you know, applauding for their backflips. We are responsible for that, we the people. Not him the mayor, not her the head of teachers in America, not him the, the news guy, pundit, smart person. <laughs> But we the people, and we've lost our sense of responsibility to community, yeah. our systems, and our home. And so the civic, civic discourse that we see reflected in our communities is what we're painting. Gangs work because there is a civic discipline there. There's respect, there's organization, there's structure. And we look at that and go, oh, that's all bad. You know, you guys are doing bad things. They're doing bad things, but beneath that, there is, at a rudimentary level, something good happening. As and we, trust. And trust. As, as so in answering your question about where we kind of go to next, 
um, on, this, on this journey, a Donald Trump, just like a Bernie Sanders, are, are a reflection of us in many respects. So if you don't like them, you don't like us. If you don't like what they're saying, what they're doing, trust me, you know what's going on in your neighborhood and in your community. You know what the conversations are in quiet moments where you know sensitive ears aren't allowed, and the conversation is raw about race. It's raw about you know income inequality. It's raw about communities of people. You know that, so don't pretend. All right, and that's that's what we're doing. So if we want to have an honest conversation about race in America, let's have it. I'm ready. I've been ready for a long time. But I'm not finding a whole lot of partners out there. If we want to have an honest conversation about education in America, let's have it. I remember just so you know, I had a sit down with the head of the teachers union in Maryland when I was lieutenant governor. And this was the best example of everything we're talking about. So we sat down, she was in my office, and I had proposed, I was in the process of proposing some reforms in education in Maryland. And so I presented them to her. I wanted her to have a heads up about what we were going to do and what we were looking at. So she sat down and she started to rip those proposals apart. She was going right and left, and it was all out of a, a political perspective. I'm a conservative Republican, I'm proposing these kind of changes. Say you don't care, you don't know, and all of that stuff. Of course, my reaction was a political one to her. And I was like, okay, see, there you go. We can't get anything done because all you guys want to do is just you care about the union more than you care about the kids, da 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 da, da right? That literally went on for 15 minutes, and it struck me in that moment, this is BS. And I looked at her and I said, you know what? We can spend the next hour peeing on each other's shoes. I was a little bit more strong. <laughs> or we can actually focus on what we both have an interest in, and that is our kids. And lo and behold, that melted away all of the hostility, all of the red, blue BS, mm -hmm. and she helped me craft a 30-point plan that we could get through the legislature that benefited teachers, that benefited parents, that benefited students. Because at the end of the day, that's what the goal was. And if we can all bring community and our institutions and our home into that space, I think we can begin to turn that corner on civil discourse. Very powerful. Let me just ask all of you, thank you so much. Um, can I just? Yeah, go ahead, Randy. You, because I, I think Michael, I think there's one more piece that Michael didn't layer on that if we're being really honest, <clears throat> is that our country is totally resegregated with the exception of our workplaces. And that if you think about transportation or the lack thereof, you think about housing, you think about schooling, you think about other institutions, so that the notion of finding common ground, and in fact, the only movement that has actually been able to do that in the last 10 years in a real way is the LGBTQ movement, mm -hmm. because people have found a way to kind of pierce through that total segregation. Yeah, yeah I, I think it's a fair point. I, I think we could debate till the cows come home about the federal government and where it's going. And it seems to me, you know, as we look ahead, whether it's Hillary or Trump, but especially if it's Hillary, you got, you got to hope for the best and prepare for the worst. And hopefully, if you know, if she were elected, you know, things would change. We get a year or two of progress before the midterms. And we get some real things done: tax reform, immigration reform. You can go down the list. But there's a real possibility that won't happen. <laughs> And so the question becomes not talking to each other, but can we, not, and not finding common ground, but finding common projects, mm -hmm. common work yeah. that we can do. Can we find things that actually work? And I would suggest right here in our midst, for example, that Gerald Chartavian has come here with his wife, Kate, to talk about Year Up. It's an organization he started in Year Up. Okay. And it's now in 18 cities. Mitch is very familiar with it. And it's been highly successful at taking young people, black and brown, mostly, Many of them who've come out of prison or come out of jail, uh, putting them back to school in one form or another, putting them back, and then finding them jobs, finding them internships, pathways in, and it's really working. It's expensive, 
but it's got a lot of support from the business community. And the issue becomes for a lot of these nonprofits, and that's where a lot of the idealism of the younger, the younger generation is going. And we have a tremendous number of young people who are very idealistic and want to change the country. But the question becomes not just one nonprofit that's successful, but how do you join the nonprofits with the government, with business, to make systems change, to move beyond, because some of these nonprofits have been successful, but they haven't really moved the needle very much. And the question that increasingly is becoming out of the nonprofit world, how do we form partnerships, larger alliances, in which we ask the government to come in and help? If they're not going to be there, they're not going to be there. We're not waiting on Washington. But rather, we're going, and, and it can be done. It's been done internationally. Look at how much progress has been made against malaria internationally, under the UN, working with national government, having philanthropists from the, of the United States, Ray Chambers, as a businessman, coming in and offering a lot of leadership, really cracked open that problem. And we can do that in some of these other areas if we stop talking to each other so much and get down to work. No. David, David, done. David and uh, Pamela, and I want to, I've been told we only got like 10 minutes left, so uh, and I want to get the audience here, but I want to ask you, 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 you made a proposal, you put a big idea yeah. on the table. I find that when it comes to social change or moving forward, the truth is most groups and most NGOs, you bring people together, not a lot of listening, most people broadcast more loudly what they were saying yesterday, and it, it just tends to be a broadcast moment. So I love your idea, but where I see the needle moving in some cases is when you bring odd bedfellows together. Absolutely. And, something. and, I'm, and Absolutely. I'm interested in how each of you thinks about that. I remember hosting uh, and getting on the same stage two people who thought they'd never be on stage together on immigration, Rahm Emanuel and Grover Norquist. Where now you see the Koch Industries and the Koch Brothers pushing uh, criminal justice reform. And so sometimes the unexpected tends to wake people up more. Well, and more I, I agree with that. But we, we did a project here at Aspen uh, on religious pluralism. Uh, they say over the last couple of years, Madeleine Albright and I happened to co-chair it. And we had a young man named Ibu Patel, uh, who's wonderful from Chicago, and uh, he has done a lot of work in this area. There's a lot of research that if you ask people to sit down and talk about their differences, their religious differences, they actually, their differences grow. Hmm. But if you ask them to go out and do a project together, yeah. like with Habitat for Humanity, and ask them to work together for two or three days on a project, and then you sit them down, they find alliances and they find ways to work with each other. And that's the kind of thing Mitch has done. Well, Mitch. But, but, uh, but to, to what Michael said, by the way, Michael, I don't want to ruin your reputation, but I've seen you on TV a lot, and I don't think you're that conservative. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> Okay, but making, no labels. I'm making, today. I'm making, I'm making, I'm making, I'm making, I want I'm making a point to you. Michael and I were, were co-lieutenant governors together. I was lieutenant governor of Louisiana, yep. and he in Maryland. And I got to see Michael on TV because he then went on to be the chair. And I looked at him and, and I said, I can work with that guy. You put me in a room with him, I can figure it out. I, I don't really care if you're conservative or if you're liberal. It doesn't matter to me. It's about figuring out how to get it done. And Michael actually, he he went through it too quickly, but he said something that's very provocative. He, he said, we got away from talking about what our positions were, what our self-identities were. And then he asked, what's in our common interest? And that goes to exactly the point that David was talking about. When you find, there is, I promise you, there is common ground. Mm -hmm. We have seen it in New Orleans, where people put down their jerseys and go out, specifically if they're helping somebody else together. Yep. Yep. If all of us are helping somebody else get out of the water, we forget that Randy's with the union and Michael's with the Republicans and... You know, David's with all the smart people. <laughs> we, forget all, we, we, forget, we forget all of that. And, and I'm telling you, in New Orleans, nothing that we have done, nothing, not one thing, has been successful unless all of the strange bedfellows were at the table. So everything we do there is now government, not-for-profit, private sector, faith-based community, and making sure that everybody's participating, not just because it's a kumbaya moment, because nobody else has enough stuff to do it on their own. Now, exactly. the, two, right, exactly. the, the big right. long-term, here's the elephant in the room. <laughs> sustainability right. and right. scalability. So let's just say Randy gets it right in Chicago on something. How does Boston pick that up? You know, yeah, how, how does do Prince Maryland. George's County right. Right. pick that up? Right. How does, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. And the then how do you scale something that works across the country? But That's a long-term challenge. But what you can do is you can do, if you have, if, you, if there is some common ground or common purpose or whatever you want to say, but put the word common in front of it. Yep. And and you end up having a sense of these are the strategies you need and the conditions you need to get it done. That's what starts creating sustainability and scalability. It's not 
what Mitch is doing in, in New Orleans, or what the mayor's doing in New Orleans, let's replicate it exactly. Right. Yeah, because no, no, no. everybody's different and every culture is different. It is, what is the strategy that worked? And, and I do think that, there, that there, there comes a time when if people just start working together, it starts moving an agenda. Cool. So we have time for maybe two zinger questions. One, or comments right here. Make it fast all the way in the back, and maybe we'll add one right here. So boom, go for it. Thank you. Who are you? My name is Cheryl Nero. I uh, have a question about um, how the disconnect between Mr. Steele's view and the leadership in his party is playing out, and, and when I hear you say we can find common projects, and yet the leadership um, in Washington says, we will prevent you from accomplishing anything. How do you rationalize right, that? So hold just a second. In the okay. very back, run the very back. He about jumped out of his chair out there. So um, <clears throat> I've enjoyed this panel very much today. But when I watch the television news that many of you I see on, I experience a very different tone different level of depth. And what I would like to hear is any of your comments about any improvements that could be done on the media. This ought to be on TV, shouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. 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 Oh. Thank you. We'll come back and then right down here in front. A hand for our, our, our mic, microphone friend here who's just right down here in front. The guy right here. Thank you so much. Great. I am Dr. Debbie. and. Along with the inequality that we're experiencing in this country is the inequality in education. Right. I know Louisiana is, is pretty low in literacy, like 49 out of 50. And I'm just wondering what is being done to help that in New Orleans. Thank you. So we've got three great questions. One on sort of the complicity of the media in shallow, vapid commentary. Uh, which thankfully by implication you said we're not doing. The other is uh, the, the, the Republican scene. And the, you know, I'll broaden your question about inequality in education, just unevenness in a lot of these issues that we care about across the country. Is that okay? So quick answers, uh, quick thoughts, David. Well, on the media, I, I plead guilty. I, you know, I, I'm part of the system that has, um, I think if Fred Friendly were here, he would tell us, whoa, whoa this is a departure from where we thought we were. Uh, going when, when television was in its early stages. Uh, and I think it, uh, reflects the, uh, it reflects not only the business values, uh, but it also reflects the decline in discourse in general in, in our politics and in our country. Uh, we're going to the lowest common denominator and the media is covering it. And, and the language changes, what's acceptable now. Was no, you couldn't say some of these things some years ago. And, and in a campaign to go out and, and charge Mrs. Clinton with being corrupt you know, to be in criminal violation of the law with no, with no hard evidence. You know, goes, or to accuse Mr. Trump of being a fraud when, you know, there's lots of smoke, but we don't have yet to see the fire. Right. You know, and we cover that stuff and we move on. And everybody, it's now just sort of part of our culture. And it's a, uh, uh, it's going to take a long time to repair this. And I, I, but I, I think if you start by trying to change the media, I don't think that's a winner. I think you start by trying to change the culture and trying to change, and let, let there be new things the media can cover and try to do it in a different Thank way. Thank you. Randy? So our education, so there's one great thing about America, about education, which is we actually believe in access for everyone. And we say we believe in universal attainment, but we look at it through the lens of social economic situations. But what I think, and your, the school, so let me say it this way. The schools that work throughout America actually do four things. They have, they, they focus like a laser on how we build the capacity of the teaching and the principal force, how we build that capacity, including if somebody can't teach, they shouldn't be there. Number two, we engage students. Engagement, 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 engagement. Not test, 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 but engagement where kids are not where we want them to be, and we bring them to where we want them to be. And number three, we address students' and families' well-being, like what we were talking about at the very start of this session. If you focus on capacity, you engage kids, 
and you address their, in, you engage kids instructionally, and you address their and their family's well-being, and you do this in a collaborative model where parents and educators really have a voice and agency, every school that collaborates, mm -hmm. builds capacity, engages students instructionally, and addresses student well-being, every school, regardless of social and economics, is successful. That is what at least my union, with lots of our allies and partners, are now starting to try to not just advocate, but to engage with and to do. Thank you. Mitch? First of all, I would agree with everything she said, and, and it is true, Louisiana is probably 49th. My guess is most of the southern states are probably worse than everybody else, but even the best state in the United States of America is bad on literacy for children. We need to be really clear about that. And if there was one thing that we could do to help with income inequality, with crime, et cetera, literacy right. is just right, air, right up there at the top with all of them. But, but, and then, and then I want to defend, I want to defend David. You know, I'm a news junkie, just like probably some folks, and I'm always on watching network news, and I'm watching Fox, and I'm watching CNN. I, I really have a hard time watching it now. And, and I see David struggling mightily with some of the idiotic things that are said by the panelists that are just hard to believe. I mean, things that nobody would ever say. And it's OK to have an opinion on the left or the right, but you can't not have an opinion that's not rooted in reality or right. the facts. Thank you. And they seemed, yeah. listen, yeah. This, is a pro, this is true Absolutely. of everybody on all of it. They seem to be unmoored from the facts and reality. And David, I know because he's a man of great grace and dignity, tries to sit there, and I think he's sitting there going, what the hell did I got myself into? And it's a real, no, it's and it's a real problem. I, I wanna, before we leave, Mitch, can we just come back to this? Yeah. Yes, it is true the schools there in, in, in Louisiana are still very low, but the turnaround that's been going on in the schools in the last few years under his leadership is really remarkable in the city of New Orleans. You have to recognize that. And, and just, just to make a, one claim, on, Mike, Michael and I are both on MSNBC, and we are really both in that, in that network trying to be David Gergen. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, Michael? Uh, no, Last absolutely. Word, I Michael. wonder why your ratings are going down. Well, this, this actually kind of dovetails into the question that you asked about uh, the, the disconnect. Um, because right now, our leadership plays to the lowest common denominator. Okay. It plays to the talking point. It plays to anything but the facts. I mean, how do you rationalize that? So how do you say to the country, when in 1992, 93, the Heritage Foundation pro 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 you know, lays out uh, a, a plan for health care in America? Sometime later, Barack Obama picks up that plan. Mitch, Mitch uh, Romney picks up that plan uh, in, in uh, his state of Massachusetts. And yet, in the presidential cycle, we can't talk about that plan rationally. We say, oh my God, that's such a bad plan. So America looks at that and they go, well, wait a minute. It was your plan. You proposed it. Um, playing to the lowest common denominator is the new reality. Playing to anything but the facts or distorting the facts is the new reality. And that's what our politics has become. It's become finger pointing, zero sum game. I win, you lose. And it doesn't matter if 20 kids get shot in an elementary school in Sandy Hook. It doesn't matter if, if 49 people get killed in a nightclub. It doesn't matter if the educational system in this community, that community isn't working because of failed policies and backward looking and thinking. What matters is whether or not the interests in Washington and in our state capitals that are funded by the, the various coalitions of lobbyists and, and vendors and other like-minded mutants. <laughs> if you allow them to poison the system, they will. And they have. Thank you. I want to do, uh, just, just before I thank everyone, First of all, thank you. This, this panel today was meant to sort of start a conversation and to trigger this question in your own minds as you go through the Ideas Festival and beyond about the state of Civitas. Before you all leave, let me mention one thing. This evening, I'm going to issue an open invitation. If you've got nothing great going on at 8.30 tonight, we're having, we're continuing the conversation at an Atlantic After Hours gathering at the Limelight where I'm gonna, Michael will be there, Randy will be there, maybe you guys will be there too, but we're gonna do a bunch of little quick vignettes of walking in uh, an opponent's uh, 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 shoes. And we're gonna have, it's gonna call Atlantic After Hours, some Pinot, some brownies, some fun. So you're all welcome to join us. But please give a round of applause to Michael Steele, Mitch Landrew, Randy Weingarten, and David Gergen. Thank you all very much.